Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar, Data Viz and Healthcare. I'm joined by four wonderful panelists uh, who will introduce shortly. Uh, today's webinar is all about a career in Data Viz with a focus uh, within the healthcare industry. Getting started, you know, advice, resources, turning points. Uh, so please get your questions ready. I'm sure many of you have come with them pen and paper already. Uh, and this is a free flowing conversation, you know, there is no PowerPoint, just our heads on Zoom. Uh, before we begin, uh, a bit more of a brief intro. I'm Jason Radford, fortunate enough to be uh, a London location organiser for the DVS, uh, Data Visualisation Society. It's a fantastic community of uh, data viz practitioners, enthusiasts, and um, we'll be popping links in the chat if you'd like to learn more. I'm also community manager at Astrato Analytics, uh, to which my thanks go out for hosting this webinar for us, giving us their Zoom. So pretty awesome there. Uh, enough for me for the time being. Uh, I think it's time to meet our four brilliant panelists. Martha, if you'd like to take it away from here uh, and start with an intro. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Martha Hernandez. I've been in the BI industry for a little over 10 years. I've um, been uh, on different industries, but I've been in, in healthcare uh, for about six years now. And i um, happy to be here. I'm right now currently working as a BI architect for uh, Northeast Georgia Health System, and GHS for short, and just happy to be here. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Melissa? Hi, I'm Melissa Plukey. I am the Chief Product Officer and co-founder of Switch RCM, which is a healthcare tech company that is focuses on RevCycle. I've been in healthcare for a little over 13 years now. Um, I've been in a variety of different positions. I have worked in operations. I have worked in tech. I've worked in BI. Um, so I've kind of covered the, the board there. Good stuff, good stuff. Uh, Michal, next up, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Michal Nakamson. I um, lead our sales engineering team that supports all of the major payer and provider customers at Snowflake. Um, I have been in the industry in data and analytics for over 20 years and keep coming back to healthcare. So studied healthcare or um, biology and science in college, ended up in um, financial services, went back to healthcare at OptumRx, which is part of United Health Group. And then um, and then went to Snowflake, which is a software company, um, and now back supporting healthcare. So I keep coming back to it. <laughs> awesome stuff, awesome stuff. And Ro, next up. Hi, everyone. I am Ro Alvarez, um, and I'm a senior data engineer at Advising. I am the young one here <laughs> with only five years of experience uh, in, in data. Uh, I've been in a variety of data roles, uh, anything from data analytics to data science um, to data engineering now, um, and kind of covering the whole end to end. Um, and I've so I studied biomedical engineering in universities. That was kind of like my start in healthcare, and then moved on to financial services, um, then a biotech, and now back to healthcare for me. Wow, amazing. As you can see, we have a, a star-studded panel here. Um, now, we have a few questions to kick off the discussion, but the purpose of today is really to hear from everyone here. So you can, chat's open, Q&A function's open, so really do get your questions in. Uh, I have a colleague working in the background, so obviously the, the option to use Q&A is our, is our sort of preferred option, but if you do want to put it in chat, then they can add it to Q&A. It's just so we make sure we don't miss anything. Um, right, and also anything that we do mention, we'll add in resources in the chat, but don't worry about missing out. Anything that we talk about, anything that we mention, anything that we share will be added into the follow-up email along with the recording of today's session. So don't worry about missing anything in the chat, scrolling forever, just sit back and, and enjoy the conversation that we're about to have. Um, awesome, so we had the intros. Now let's dive in and find out how a panelist got to start in healthcare. Uh, Michal, um, have you always worked in healthcare? You said you've been in for 20 years. Um, how did your path take you into the industry and sort of what's kept you in it? Or what's kept you returning to it? Um, so like I said, I, I studied science in college. Um, I actually took a genetics class in high school and fell in love with it. Um, the way that it works, how it predicts, you know, how what your um, 
what you look like and, and all of that, how DNA works and how everyone's different um, and truly love that. And then when I went to college, I studied biology, um, loved immunology. Um, for me, the thought I had originally thought about being a doctor, but scared myself <laughs> because of the long path to get there. Um, ended up taking a an HTML course because it was that long ago and um, loved it. So ended up graduating and moving into computers and computer science, worked in data and analytics at in financial services and other organizations, ended up going back into healthcare. Um, I'm really drawn to healthcare. I love the impact that we can make. And I think that coming at it from a data and analytics perspective allows you to like, we can truly make an impact on the entire industry with data and analytics. If people can collaborate, if yeah. we can bring data together and make it easy, um, we can have, I, I personally feel that the work that I do here has a bigger impact on the healthcare industry than working in one specific organization because I get to work with and influence all of them. Um, and so that's, that's why I keep coming back to it and, and why I'm here now. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Um, Melissa, I think you have a, a very similar, but also very, very different experience in healthcare uh, in the ways in which you work. So how did you sort of find yourself in the fold and, and what's kept you in it? Sure, sure. Um, just to add at first, I did also take an HTML class when I was 17 or 18 nice. and also fell in love with, fell in love with it. Um, I didn't actually end up going into um, computer science when I went to school. I got a degree in finance, realized my senior year of, of college that it was not for me. Um, it was just not something I was interested in. So I was looking for a job when I graduated college and it was during the recession in the US and I um, just couldn't find anything locally. I ended up getting a job at Epic, which is um, one of the largest uh, health or EHRs in the country. Um, I initially decided to get to try to work there for a year and then go back to where I'm from because it's a different part of the country and I never went back. Um, I loved working there. Uh, there's a lot to be said about Epic, both positively and negatively, but um, one thing that they do a really good job of is hiring really in, really intelligent, motivated people. And I was surrounded by tons of people that really wanted to help the industry and fix the issues. And it, it, was, it was amazing working there. It was very interesting. Um, I've worked in healthcare since then in a variety of um, different roles. Um, I've worked as product management. I've worked in um, BI. I've worked in um, development. Um, uh, little bit of sales because we have a smaller company. So I kind of dabble in everything at, at this point in time. But um, I've stuck around in healthcare because there's so many different problems to solve. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's thousands of vendors out there, but there's always a new problem to work on. There's a new issue that your company or you as an individual can work on that no one else has yet and that just it keeps it interesting every day um we we're currently working on things that um there aren't any competitors out there that have done it because there's so many issues and so many different things in healthcare that need to be explored that there's just a lot of option out there for you and that's um keeps it interesting for me every day awesome um, we've actually just had a, our first question in, uh, following on the back of uh, sort of your guys' intros into how you came into healthcare. Uh, I find it hard to find actual data visualization jobs in the healthcare industry. Most of the roles are mainly focused on data analysis, SQL, Power BI skills, that sort of thing. Um, does anybody want to jump in and sort of beyond sort of finding a path through a, a back door into healthcare? Does anybody want to jump in and answer how they sort of found their way into healthcare that may be of, of help to Daria? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll, I'll jump in. So kind of similar to um, what M Michelle, I, I'm going to butcher your name, sorry. <laughs> um, a little bit similar to that. So I first kind of thought, you know, I want to be a doctor and have 
a lot of impact and just go go study medicine and then I saw the really long path that that is I was like nope I can't do that <laughs> I need to you know get moving um, I'm quite a hands-on person so I, I went into an engineering degree instead um, and graduated with a master's and coming out of that um, it was actually quite difficult to find um, jobs in the healthcare sector in the UK um, that didn't require a PhD. So it's kind of when I started realizing that I was really into, into data, um, maybe more like the, the backend side of it. So analyzing data and creating data pipelines and cleaning data and stuff like that. Um, so that's when I went into financial services. So nothing to do with healthcare really, um, and really lacking the the impact that I think we were talking about earlier, right? Like you don't see it as much. It's like I'm doing something um, where we're just helping this organization make more money, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, which I guess it's it's another type of impact, right? But it wasn't really what I was interested in. Um, and then eventually I did, I think as my career in data and my expertise in the data industry progressed, it was easier to then move back into um, the healthcare sector. Um, so I think if you can't find something directly, try and figure out, you know, okay, if I can't find data visualization in healthcare, can I do data visualization somewhere else, get really, really good at it, and then come back to it? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like my, my point. Awesome. Thanks for that. Martha, is that a, a similar path that you've taken? You sort of straight into data viz and then from there path out into healthcare? Um, yeah. Or did you? Yeah. Yeah, no, and uh, it's interesting that how Rope uh, placed it because uh, that's basically how it was for me. I, I never even really thought about going into healthcare. Uh, I was born and raised in Mexico uh, and then about six years ago, I was, I mean, I've always been in, in BI and, and data analysis and, and that type of roles. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine reached out and say, hey, there's an opportunity here in the U.S. Uh, in southeast Michigan. Uh, there's a um, health system that is looking for someone that it's uh, not a consultant. So they want to hire someone. Why, why don't you apply? So apply for the job. And uh, the leaders there, uh, they took a leap of faith uh, because I didn't have any experience whatsoever in healthcare. Um, and they just looked at my technical background and they, they liked my profile. And mm -hmm. um, uh, although I was completely new to the industry, to the culture and everything, I think it was one of the best decisions I've made. Uh, what has kept me in healthcare is that it's like, like Mikala and Melissa said, it's, it's an ever growing industry it, it, there's mm -hmm. always opportunities there's always an opportunity to grow to learn um, both as a professional and, and in the industry um, because there are so many pieces so many players that work together to provide a service I think it's a very dynamic environment that you just I mean you can't stop learning you can't stop um, finding new opportunities for improvement and um Plus, you have that rewarding feeling that you're providing an essential service um, and, and contributing to something bigger than mm -hmm. than you. And, and it's just amazing. So I really, really like being in healthcare. Yeah, I really like that point of uh, sort of the tangible impact that you're making. It, it's, it's quite real, isn't it? Um, and I think that tees us up nicely for a, a question here from Jessalyn, all the way from Melbourne. So hello, welcome to the webinar. Um, she wants to know um, some of uh, our panel's interesting projects. So perhaps does anybody have a really interesting or fascinating project they've worked on recently or sort of the highlight of their career so far, particularly with what we've just been speaking about, sort of making impacts in healthcare, you know, has anything really stood out to to anyone here? I mean, we I've got one that's kind of close to my heart because it's what I did for my master's project at uni. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and a little bit me. So we were we were working with um, sniffer dogs. And sniffer dogs can actually, as well as detect, you know, like the usual drugs and, and explosives, mm -hmm. um, they can actually they can actually also detect disease. Um, so they're very good at, at smelling uh, cancer before you can detect it um, by other methods. Yeah. So that was really interesting. Um, and so yeah, that was kind of like my first interaction with like a big data project, and and I was working a little bit like hardware and, and software and building a device that would make it a lot cheaper to train these dogs so they don't have to be like sitting down or uh, 
signaling to the handler um, whenever they detect something. So just like measuring breathing rate and, and heart rate um, from the dog would be able to tell when they're um, detecting something. And that has kept on going uh, kind of like after I graduated, uh, there was a PhD student who took it on board and they oh, wow. started a company. So yeah, kind of like long lasted, long lasting um, project close to my heart. That is pretty awesome. I think, yeah, Krista and chat sums up. That is really neat. I mean, yeah, nail on the head there. Um, anybody else with a really cool project they'd like to mention? Something close to their heart as well, or even just something that was all nuts and bolts and they able to get their hands dirty as it were. I can talk about the first product that we uh, developed for our, our company. Um, we, so we work in the uh, revenue cycle area. So we're, we're looking at um, charges. Uh, so if you go to the doctor, there's a charge that, that is sent to your insurance company, they pay it and um, that payment is sent back to the hospital. It's supposed to equal out and, um, and uh, that's said and done, but it's never that simple. So we developed a product that um, at the time we used ClickSense for it, um, where we essentially look at all of the hundreds of thousands of charges that a hospital will um, put onto, it's called a claim, a claim and send it out to the insurance companies. Um, the insurance companies have to pay according to the contracts that the insurance company makes with the healthcare organization. It is different for, per organization in the US. Um, they don't always do that though. Um, there's uh, tons of different ways where they can mess up. They can forget to add a provider to something. They can forget to update something. Um, they can just pay at the wrong rate. So there's a, a, a lot of different ways for them to not pay the correct rate. And oftentimes they're, they're paying $4 off, $5 off. It's not like you're seeing this big thousands yeah. uh, of dollar discrepancy. However, over millions of claims that, that, that adds up. So we developed a way to uh, automatically look at all of the charges that are going out look at all of the payments that are coming in, marry that up to the, the contracts, and then see if there is that underpayment and then group all of that stuff into logical um, uh, different groupings for the provider to then go back to the, to the uh, insurance company and say, mm -hmm. you underpaid us $4 uh, 70,000 times over the last two years for this reason because you paid at last year's contract rate or you paid at this other section of your contract rate for these providers that should get something else. Um, it's basically impossible to do that manually. Uh, it, it would not be cost effective to have someone <laughs> yeah, looking imagine. at every single one <laughs> and submitting something for $4, $4. So um, the fact that we can use BI to gather that information up together and then present it in a logical way to the insurance companies has really helped uh, recover some of that money that is due to the hospitals. Wow. And that's the important thing. Hospitals getting the money that they need to serve patients. That, that's quite critical. So that's an awesome little thing. That's, that's fantastic. Um, Michal, I'll, I'll throw the microphone over to you working with, with Snowflake. Uh, obviously, not mentioning any names, but you must have um, been working on some really really cool projects is there anything that you can can mention or something that's really stood out to you in terms of a, a use case or a project that you've worked on yeah actually um during covid um mm -hmm. one of the so one of the uh, capabilities of snowflake is the ability to share data across organization simply um we had a customer who went out and curated all of the covid data. So initially it was the Johns Hopkins, the World Health Organization, et cetera, all about tests and um, negative results, positive results, et cetera, by zip code. And it was national or international. And so what that allowed people to do, and then they shared it for free through the Snowflake platform. Oh, wow. So we had thousands of customers who were just leveraging this data. And as they updated it, as vaccines came out, they added vaccine information to it. Where were vaccines being distributed? Was it Moderna? Was it Pfizer, et cetera? And what that allowed other customers to do, which was awesome, is they didn't have to go curate the data themselves. They could just leverage it. And so every industry needed this. It was healthcare, 
hospital systems, things like that needed to know where COVID spikes were, et cetera. Um, retailers needed to know where to open stores, where to close stores, things like that. So it really, um, and COVID, while a horrible thing, it actually brought people together, right? It made people do things they probably wouldn't have done before, like collaborate on data and things like that. So um, so I thought that was a really cool, um, really cool use case. Amazing. Uh, that's... <laughs> some really interesting things I didn't expect to come out of that that question there so uh, thank you everyone for sharing their stories now what I, I did want to also talk about is obviously we've covered how everyone came came into healthcare whether sort of like directly or follow a follow a path there um, and also some of the cool things you've worked on but if we roll our way back I think hurdles is a, a good one to talk about you know whether it's something that like we've, we've already spoken about, you know, couldn't actually find a role in healthcare or perhaps there's a sometimes thought that healthcare is perhaps slightly behind the trend in certain technologies. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, to our panelists, have you come across any major hurdles? And, and again, this could be specific to healthcare or it could be data viz in healthcare specific, like we can get as granular as we like. Um, Martha, is that something that you've seen or what hurdles have you experienced so far in your career? And that could also oh. like be product led, it could be uh, job wise, or even could be sort of like lack of available mentors, you know, it is quite a, a broad question there. Yeah, so for me, uh, there were uh, different aspects of the hurdles that I've had to overcome. First of all, the language barrier uh, and the changing culture. So we don't do healthcare the same way in Mexico that we do here, processes, um, language, terminology. They're, they're very similar, but I mean, unless you're in the healthcare industry, they're not very common words that you yeah. have out there. So learning the terms, the acronyms, and all of that, it, it was a a big learning curve still is um, at times. And also the workflows, trying to keep up with uh, changes, new regulation, new medication, new procedures, new um, uh, everything. I mean, everything is just in constant change. So, um, and I think in, in the roles that I've been understanding the business, understanding the workflows has been crucial when mm -hmm. looking at data. So some insights become more evident um, to, like something that Melissa mentioned, some of the um, like um, Medicare or some of the other um, vendors out there, they have different processes and they don't pay the same way or have, you have to follow certain like forms, fill in some things that can affect other metrics like length of stay. Oh, I didn't have this form approved, so I can't do this. It takes me two days to do X or Y things. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of these things become more evident once you know the workflow, once you know how uh, they interact with your organization and, and become easier to explain. Um, so yeah, some of the hurdles I've faced. That's, I think, again, something I sorry. didn't expect. Sorry, it, carry on, Karen. No, no, sorry to jump in, but I think I can relate with the language barrier. Um, so I'm originally from Spain and I'm based in, in the UK now. Um, and we as a company advising uh, work with the NHS quite a lot, so that's the National Health Service. Um, and yeah, I think learning all of the acronyms, not even just like Spanish to English, but also just coming from, I think the last company I was working for was more like biotech and like you come into the NHS and it's all of these different acronyms that everyone is referring to. And you're like, yep. what? <laughs> so I've been here for like over a year now and there's still times that I have to raise my hand and be like, sorry, can someone explain this to me? Cause I don't know, I've never <laughs> heard this acronym before. And then you'll have, you know, you'll have times when even an acronym means more than one thing. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely relate to that one. Um, and I think the other one, sorry, I'll just keep going, Jason. Love it, just keep me. going. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the, the other one for me, you kind of mentioned that like sometimes healthcare is seen as like an industry that's almost like lagging behind in, in technology. Um, oh, yeah. So like I said, we work with the NHS, massive health organization. The NHS is kind of like broken down into trusts or like smaller orgs. Um, and they all have different systems. So I think that's been quite a big one for us is like, how do you combine all of that? Just essentially what, what we do, combine data from different systems so you can do things like benchmarking, um, price products, um, things like that. And then 
trying to overcome that technology barrier um, and implement things like Snowflake, which we're we're working on doing <laughs> um, and bringing in the new tech. Love it, love it. Uh, I just had a question here that I want to quickly cover off uh, from Nissin. Thank you very much. Will there be any mock-ups or demo of any visualization in healthcare later on this call? Um, no, unfortunately, this is not the call for that. I mean, maybe that could be a part two, who knows? But this is all around sort of careers, uh, mentors, game-changing careers, like how, how our panelists got started, how they found it, how they're working in it, and sort of general data viz advice and, and sort of tailored towards the healthcare industry. So yeah, no demos, there's no PowerPoint here um but stay tuned or, or reach out to us afterwards and i'm sure there's something we can we can send through um now i did see a, a really awesome question sort of slightly related to hurdles um uh where was it yes uh laura dana uh, what advice would you give to someone with a data analytics experience who wants to break into data viz uh, data viz in healthcare um what tools would the panel advise focusing on um can I, can I yeah, go for it. 100%. There's been a lot of questions around getting into the industry, finding mm -hmm. a job, things like that. As far as data viz tools, I'll leave that to the experts. I'm more back end than front end, but um, it's you have to put yourself out there, right? So join, network, meet people, um, get to know people, join user groups in your in your area whether it's a data viz user group, an analytics user group, a healthcare user group, or something like that, um, reach out to people, ask people to be your mentor. Don't just wait for people to come to you, be proactive about building your network. Um, and then what I have seen um, be really successful as well is start building data viz. There's so much data out there that you can access today that's public. Definitely. Pick healthcare data and start building a portfolio, putting stuff out there. So when people look for you, Google you, or look you up on LinkedIn, you have some stuff out there that you can speak to and show what you've done. Um, and so I think there's a whole bunch of questions on that. When someone sees that, when someone meets you in their user group and they they know someone who has an opportunity, they're gonna think of you and connect, make that connection. So I think that's really important from, you have to kind of take ownership of your career in, in that. No, I think that's some really valuable advice, actually. And it also sort of leads us on to the next section that I, I sort of wanted to bring to the, the front. And that was, what have you guys found has, has sort of really elevated your path? And, and you, you mentioned there, joining communities, networking. Um, have, have you guys found particular success with mentors? You know, has that been a, a really big asset for you? Or perhaps you just played with all the tools and, and that was the, the way you, you got the next role because you were so well versed in the tool. Did you become a specialist in a particular tool? Or perhaps you took a, an online course. We even have a question here about courses that you that are recommended that we can take, whether it's on LinkedIn or wherever. So what have been the, the game changers for the panel here? You know, uh, what's really set the, the career off and on, on the path that you wanted to follow? Um, Melissa, Roe, Martha, whoever wants to sort of jump in with that first sort of initial insight. I think uh, Mikhail really set us up there. Yeah, um, I can I can take that. Um, I started in BI using ClickSense and or ClickView actually, and then ClickSense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the the community. I, so I was self taught on that. I didn't take training courses or or um, I don't have a degree in anything along those lines. Um, the community for um, for any of the BI tools out there, um, especially especially Click, there, it is very helpful and there's a ton of documentation, a ton of examples, um, many people that you can just post a question and people will people that don't know you will give you advice. Um, so I would say utilize those things. Um, it really helps you grow um, and learn both the front end and back end of whatever tool that you're you're working with. Um, I would say also, I think it's important to, I, you can't just focus on data viz. Like if you don't know what you are working with, you're never going to build something that is helpful for end users. So if you don't know it yourself, working very closely with the business people that do, and then also on the back end, making sure that those people that, that prep that data for you, or if you're doing that, make sure you know that data. Because if you're you're just trying to build pretty UI 
whatnot, it's not going to be valuable without having that full connection there. Yeah, I think I really, I really agree with that, Melissa. And it's almost like we talk about database, but you know, it's not just a dashboard that you're building. At the end of the day, it's a product, right? So you need to talk about, you need to think about your end users, what they what they want to see, what they're looking for. And then even like like you say, understand the back end of it as well. Where's this data coming from? Um, yeah, I, I I think that's that's key as well. Um, and going back to game changers, um, I think people is a really good one. So we talked about networking. Um, I think networking is key. And then once you find your network, keep the people that empower you, um, you know, and, and when you start looking at tools, if you find someone who starts to, you know, they, they like to have the nerdy conversation about that tool <laughs> that you're trying out. <laughs> um, I've, I found that really useful. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I'll have the nerdiest conversations with one of my brothers, for example, you know, we've been talking a lot about open AI recently, <laughs> just as an, as an example. Um, and then the, the final one, I think that has been a game changer for me has been working in small companies um, or startups. So I think it really allows you to test out uh, multiple solutions. Um, you have to really convince the people who are managing the money because they don't have a lot of it. So you have to have very strong convincing arguments of why you're choosing the tool that you're using, which means that you're gonna have to do a couple of POCs and test a couple of them. Um, so yeah, I think that that has been like instrumental for me in my career. I'd awesome. like to piggyback on a little bit on what Melissa and Ro have uh, added. Uh, I had a very similar uh, BI path like Melissa. I started with ClickView, ClickSense, and now moving uh, to Astrato. And um, I think it is it, it beyond the tool. I think it is about learning uh, how to look at the data and learning what you want to get out of the data, um, understanding what are the drivers of, of that, that data or, or the problem that you're trying to solve. And more than learning how to use the data, well, at least for me, it's not about learning and going through manuals or, or learning, poking around and learning the tool. It's, it's mostly about using those tools to take them a little bit further and, and solving something. So I think if you have a challenge, if you have a problem you want to solve, you want to, um, something that you want to analyze, I mean, just take that as an example and, and, and just drive, take it all the way. And um, as far as mentors go, go, I've reached out to a lot of um, business leaders. So uh, some of the strategy leaders in the previous company that I used to work uh, on, I reached out to them and I said, hey, I want to learn about what you do and how you see data, how you use data. It's nothing related on how, how they, they, they didn't do any dashboards, they didn't do anything, but how they use data to make decisions, how they use data to, to drive their jobs. So um, I think that's also been very useful for me. And of course, what Rose said, um, leaders and, and, and people, the, they are crucial. So I think um, I, I met a lot of great leaders along my career, and they are part of what what have <laughs> taken me here. And those leaders that are willing to learn along with you, that not only trust your experience, but challenge your approach. I mean, they let you do your things the way you wanted to do, but they challenge it. And most importantly, that they give you the opportunity. So I think that's one of the most valuable things I found on the leaders that I've come across. Amazing. Uh, Mikhail, anything to add into your, your point that you sparked this whole conversation with? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I love the addition of the business value. That's, that's so important. Um, I think that's a really critical point because a lot of organizations are just doing things like building a data warehouse or building and hoping someone will use it rather than, <laughs> rather than focusing on providing value. Um, and so I, I love that point. Um, and then mentorship, I've had great mentors in my life. And I think that's, that's key is mm -hmm. having people around you that help lift you up, that can provide guidance. And there's different types of mentors, right? Some people 100%, yeah. are like career focused. They're going to help, you know, some people you talk to when you're challenged, some people you don't, some people you ask for. So find a bunch of different types of mentors. Um, I took a 
a coaching class and they talked about building your board of directors, right? And so having a different, like okay. going out and asking people and, and surrounding yourself with those types of, of support. And to your point earlier, you have to ask people that have been in the industry for 10, 20, 30 years, they're happy to help you for the most part, but they're not going to go looking for you. You have to ask for help. Definitely, definitely. And I, I think what I'll do is, because we, we definitely don't have time to go through more now, any um, resources that our panel have used, whether it's a community they joined or a networking group or a meetup group, uh, I'll ask for all of those suggestions and I can sort of share it with everyone uh, in the follow-up email, because I think that would be, that'd be awesome. Um, I did expect this question as well, but considering we're talking about game changes that everyone's experienced, I'll raise the, the AI question. And this is all very sort of high level and theorizing, but how do you think uh, AI will impact or has already impacted um, collectively your works in healthcare? You know, has it, have you used it in, in, in data visit as helping your day to day or are you seen it in the sort of the wider healthcare market or industry as it is? I, I can jump in. Um, I haven't personally created anything. I mean, I, I've been poking around and, and, and learning yeah. Python, learning um, some predictive models and machine learning and, and stuff like that, but never really applied to something um, in, in my current jobs. But I think uh, in medicine in general, I mean, the technology is still applied on a patient by patient base. I mean, you can't have one size fits all. And I think what AI has been doing for us, it's um, helping accelerate this. So we're using more the software as a, as a medical device that can help you accelerate how we do things, even though it's it's not a specific or, or I don't know, but I said, it's not brought to fit everyone, but you can help individual patients by accelerating how we treat them. So you can detect uh, certain diseases by looking at specific imaging studies, or now you can um, evaluate the risk of having maybe a seizure or monitor your uh, glucose and help monitor and, and have better care of your chronic diseases. So I, I think it's really pushing us to move from being more reactive and, and, and switching into more preventative medicine and, and not just um, taking care once the patient is ill. Yeah, I really, I really agree with your, with your point, Martha. And I think Talking about, so I have built kind of like a couple of solutions. Like I said, I'm a bit of a, I'm, I'm a, bit of a nerd with these things. <laughs> um, maybe like less sexy data. Um, so obviously we, we work with uh, procurement data um, and things, you know, like, uh, I don't know how much I can say really, but looking <laughs> at uh, names, names and like the way that we process like free text, for example, right? So that's all uh, natural language. Um, and any anywhere where we have natural language, I think it was a little bit of like a mystery. We were trying to like use deterministic models to try and extract insights from that. Um, and I think this large language models and, and AI have kind of like opened the door where like you don't need to be an expert in machine learning anymore to be able to create a product um, that, that uses this technology now which, you know, like I'm not a data science expert and, and it has allowed me to build some uh, some things already. So that's that's really interesting. Um, and then along the lines of like what Martha was saying, relating more towards, towards medicine, um, I think she made a really good point that, you know, we're not one size fits all when it comes to medicine. And I think, again, large language models open up the door for personalized medicine and just understanding a lot more each of us as individuals as a patient, you know, we're talking about genetics before, like, what are your genetics? How does that affect the specific disease that you have? Uh, or like, you know, does your genetics affect the drug that you're going to take? Is there, is there, if you have a certain dose of it, is it going to be better? Um, and all of that will like come into play, I think, in the near future. Love it. Love it. What about uh, you, Michal? How do you see AI impacting or have you already sort of seen the, the impact of it now or are you using it day to day? We're getting a lot of a lot of questions around yeah. how we're supporting LLM and, and generative um, AI and things like that. But I, I agree completely with what Martha and, and Ro have said already. Um, it's going to be an accelerator, right? It's going to help us make better decisions. 
we have to be careful how we use it. We can't trust it 100%, right? It's going to give us direction and allow physicians to have better insights to make better decisions for their patients, but they still have to validate and make those decisions, right? Um, I think it, I personally think it'll help a lot in mental health as well, because a lot of, a lot of, it, it's not as cut and dry, right? It's more around how people behave. Um, what they say in social media, things like that versus, you know, a chemical in your blood or something, right. Which is yeah. much easier to diagnose. So I think, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, um, even in, in development, right. So programming analytics, uh, data quality, someone asked about, um, governance and, uh, GDPR and HIPAA. If we can use AI to, find those things in the data and help us be more secure. So it's not, so there's lots of ways that um, it's kind of the sky's the limit, right? On how we can leverage this. Yeah, this is, this is true. And I think we're seeing it more literally day by day. It's sort of accelerating very, very quickly. Um, so I like the fact that we've looked at the future now and I have a really, really nice question here from Lisa. Um, what does everyone's day-to-day -day look like? We have such a, a broad variety of, of roles on the panel. Um, and I, I think that's an amazing question. You know, we, we've spoken about so much here, but we haven't actually spoken about what the day-to-day -day roles look like. So Melissa, what does that look like for you, both as a, sort of a developer and a, and a founder? Like that's yeah. quite extraordinary. Um, so we have a very small company. We're under 20 people right now. So I, as I said earlier, I have my hands in everything. Um, we are currently rolling out a uh, Snowflake and a Strato for some of our BI products, and I am the head over that area. Um, I work a lot with our team that is the industry expert. So I have experience in um, the operations side and I'm knowledgeable about um, the rev cycle, but we have people on our team that are truly experts in this area. So I work a lot with them to make sure that they are, the data that they have gotten is something that our team understands internally. Um, I work to clean that data right now. Um, so I'm looking at every field that comes in in each of the different extracts that we are getting and making sure that it looks right and uh, finding out what it means from, from that team. And then I am working to, uh, we work uh, with SQL, so I'm getting the SQL ready for that. And then I'm actually also working in Estrato to build the vis visualization. So I kind of have a large role right now. Awesome. Martha, what about you? Um, so it's a little bit of, of, of everything right now when it comes to setting up Estrato. Um, also, we're, we're working with Snowflake too. So it's it's been putting together some of the guidelines while still developing and then going back and tweaking, okay, these processes are not going to work because we're not going to document, I don't know, something in 10 different places. So we just have to streamline that. So it's a lot of learning on the job, I think, right now. Um, we are trying to set up our ground rules around how we um, – structure our data on the snowflake side or security so it's a lot of uh trying to do architectural design pieces while still developing some of the dashboards on the estrato side pulling the data validating the data um gathering requirements and stuff like that so every every day it's a little bit different but in general that's that's a day-to-day <laughs> Nice, 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 nice. Ro, what about you? When you're not deep diving into AI or <laughs> self-reclaiming nerd topics, what you, what's your day to day look like? Uh, I think it's actually quite similar to what Martha and Melissa have said. So mm -hmm. um, at advising all of our current like production processes, they run on ClickSense. Um, and I'm basically leading on a massive project to migrate that across to Snowflake. Um, so right now that means building data pipelines in things like AWS and, and Python, where we're standardizing all of the different data sets that we get, loading them into Snowflake. And then once they're in Snowflake is where we get to the modeling part. Um, and we're using uh, an open source tool called DBT for that. Um, yes, and then, yeah, <laughs> I like that. Um, and then once once we have all of that is when we start uh, looking at Astrato actually as well for, for data visualization and bringing that out into our platform where our clients can, can use it. Um, so it's just different bits and pieces of that whole kind of like end-to-end -end, um, where like Martha was saying is setting it all up. Um, we're also at the moment uh, 
building out the data engineering team uh, at advising. So we've got two new joiners and is making sure that we're setting up uh, best practices. So there's a little bit of research on my side. Um, and yeah, like I said, setting all of that up. Um, things like um, CI, CD pipelines. So, you know, whenever someone is doing a bit of development, are they then doing a pull request? So we have another pair of eyes on it and yeah, things like that. That's more like the developer world. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Michal, what about you? What does yeah, it look so like my, day to day? My world's a little bit different. I used to be a developer. I'm no longer doing that. But what I do every day is work with different organizations to understand their requirements, understand what the business needs are, and help them architect solutions, right? So um, how do they build the data pipelines? What capabilities can they leverage? Um, we help with optimization. We help with, so sometimes we're really hands-on, sometimes it's much more high level. Um, one thing that I continue to do, even you know, in any role that I'm in, whether it's like a leader role or an individual contributor role is always hand, stay hands-on, stay current. Um, because I think there's huge value in being able to to have the experience in what you're talking mm -hmm. about, right? And when yeah. you're leading people, being able to have that credibility and and truly, truly partner with them and 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 help guide them. So, um, so yeah. So my day is very different. I'm I'm not building data viz today, but um, but working with lots of organizations, and we we have lots of partners like Estrada that um, Estrada that we partner with. So, um, yeah. That's Awesome. Thank you very much for that. It's, it's so good to hear these sort of both the similarities and also the sort of the vast differences as well. Um, I, think, I think, sorry, sorry, Jason, I'm just yeah. going to very quickly. Keep going. No, uh, <laughs> I'll no, be no. quiet. Just, just very, very quickly. I think one thing that I haven't mentioned that's kind of like day to day as well is convincing the rest of the business that what we're doing, one, adds value and that two, we're going to get there. Because yep. I think <laughs> building a data warehouse kind of like from scratch or migrating to a data warehouse it can be quite a lengthy process and we you know we have business stakeholders just keep being like where is this <laughs> why are we not there yet um mm -hmm. so i think that's the other side of it is convincing them that we're making progress and that we're going to be adding business value awesome i'd love to hear it all right Roy, i'm going to keep you on the spot there because uh, we just had a good question i think uh you can you can kick off um how do you continue to learn and stay on top of both the software and the platforms you use and also i think sort of the, the wider knowledge and in industry now is that just simply something that you find natural because it, you're hugely interested in it or is it a case that you actually schedule time in your diary to learn it or you have reminders or something like that how do you how do you stay on top of it so i block out two hours every week where mm -hmm. I'm just learning. Um, and I try and awesome. frame it so it's something that is also related to the business. Um, so, you know, like the last few weeks, I've obviously been doing a little bit on, on AI um, and how can we apply it to the business and building something related to that. Um, but I think it, for me, is if I don't block the time in my calendar, I won't do it. So it's just <laughs> yep. it's very hard, you know, things keep popping up. Uh, you're, you're stuck building something. Someone else comes so like, oh, can you do this report? Can you pull these metrics? And then you just forget. Um, so I think that's that's quite um, important, just blocking some time. Um, and then the the other side of of you know what's still relevant, where which tools to look at, what to learn. Um, like you know we were talking right before the webinar about running, how much we, <laughs> we like running. Yeah. Um, so I try and listen to podcasts uh, while I'm out running awesome. and just try and see what's what's current right now. I love that. I love that. Uh, what about you, Martha? How do you stay on top of everything? Um, I, I have a couple of subscriptions. I TDRL, I think it's the name of it. It just gives you very small pieces of, of what's new and technology. So I get that uh, as a email digest every morning. So uh, just having that type of very small reads that could give you summarize. And if you want to just dive in more into one of those, um, that's helpful. I need to start blocking my time because I, I say I'm going to do it, but I haven't been very consistent at, at doing it and trying to uh, learn more every week. Mm -hmm. But um, what I've been doing is it's learning for, um, uh, or learning the tools and, and things that are very pertinent to my current job role. So if I need to learn more about uh, Epic, 
pieces or, 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 or mm -hmm. modules, I, I need to focus on that and not so much on, on the things that passionate uh, that I'm passionate about, like, like AI or maybe data and things like that. But um, it just depends on what I'm currently, uh, what's currently on my plate. Awesome. Love it. Melissa, what about you? Um, right now, we're learning a lot of new uh, technologies. So, uh, so Snowflake, for example, that is something that is new to our company. And we don't have any experts here in Snowflake um, when we started. So just honestly, reading documentation, reading blogs, reading what other people have done with it, um, features that people have implemented or what they can do with it, uh, looking at examples has really been helpful. Um, yeah, so that's, that's our current um, how I'm learning technology. Um, as far as the industry, our team, again, it's a small team. They will, everybody is on a group chat um, in our organization. They will constantly put new articles, new things that they've read, um, just uh, new things that are happening in the industry into the chat. So just reading those two as well um, to see the different things that our whole team has been seeing in the industry is helpful as well. I really actually like that. And that's almost a community in and of itself, isn't it? Just that little channel mm -hmm. that's sharing yeah. knowledge is, is, is actually fantastic. Yeah. Um, what about you, Mihal? Are you a, a podcast fan? Are you a, a group chat fan? How are you uh, getting your knowledge and staying on top of everything? Yeah, um, I'm similar to Ro, actually. I listen to a lot of podcasts and love it. Um, usually while I'm exercising. So that's a great time. And I, I think listening to that helps the exercise go faster. So um, it kills two birds with one stone. But um, there are a few podcasts. What like the Data Chief is really good. It's, um, I don't know if you listen to that one, but it, she interviews Cindy House and interviews different data leaders. And it's just really interesting. There's always good nuggets that I take from those. Um, and I'm finding that like Freakonomics and things like that. I learned things I would have never studied on my own. And there's always something relevant to my world, even if it's completely different topic. Um, and so I find, I find that useful too. And I think it helps you. For me, I spent a lot of time just doing, you know, studying technology, studying and so listening to those podcasts kind of helps you expand your, your knowledge. And again, it's, there's always something relevant to what you're doing or what's going on in your life. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, Julia, uh, can you provide the names of email digests everyone subscribes to, podcasts, et cetera? Yes, what I'll do is I'll, um, rather than taking up time on the call, I will uh, speak to the panelists individually and we'll get a a whole bunch of information probably like two a4s worth of links urls podcasts videos courses all that good stuff and we'll share that in the follow-up so don't worry we will we will get to all of that um certainly certainly um there's i quite like this question here um do you think data science community underestimates data viz in terms of complexity and value and how do you manage these opinions if they arise um <laughs> someone probably smarter than i has to answer that question but I, I think there is is obviously friction between roles but it's also perspectives right um so who here would like to jump on the, the data science versus data viz complexity question i can i can give it a go <laughs> let's go bro let's go um <laughs> I think, honestly, like just get people to switch roles for a bit. Uh, so I think, because I think I've I've been, you know, I've had to wear all hats, you know, uh, working in a small a small company now, and I was working for a startup before where I was basically the only person who could do software and data there. Mm -hmm. And you have to be the visualization, the data engineer, the data analytics person, and it's the only way that you really understand what it takes to get to that end product. Um, and you know, if you can't switch roles then get people to actually explain what, what it takes. So I think that's coming back to what I said earlier, when I have to convince the you know, senior management that I'm, <laughs> that I'm doing what I need to be doing uh, to get to that end goal of building a data warehouse, right? It's like, they, they might not understand those tiny steps that I need to be taking every day. Um, so it's try and like explain that um, in the best possible way. So it's just communicating, communicating really. Communication, communication, communication. I love it. Uh, it's so true for so many things in life, and this one is uh, no different. Um, anybody else would like to jump on that question? Or answer, rather? 
I just want to say, I think data visualization is required for data science because you can do all the data science you want and predictions, but the only way to communicate it and actually get value out of it is through the visualization, right? Um, so, so maybe that's something that you can you can talk to them about. But and all the data scientists are doing data visualization anyway; they're already doing it. <laughs> so. Awesome, awesome. Um, we are running very, very close to the line. Um, there's a, a question here from a while back that I, I did want to get to. Um, recommendations, best practices, uh, and advice for approaching potential employers. You know, how do, how do whether we're enthusiasts or, or practitioners, how do we put our best foot forward when applying for for roles in data viz, whether data viz in general or, or specific to healthcare? Um, who has some good advice to to help people on the call out with that? You know, is it portfolio based or how do we get our best foot forward and, and get the roles that we're after? I think it was mentioned earlier. I can't remember who mentioned it, sorry. But um, there's a lot of free data out there that you can use. There's free tools um, mm -hmm. to plug a Strato, but you can get five free users for a Strato. Like <laughs> you have the ability to use tools that are free tools that are out there to make your Definitely. portfolio free data free data in healthcare, um, uh, cms.gov has a ton of free data um, on um, national stats that you can use to, to create, even if they're just sample product or sample application, sample vis visualizations to bring that portfolio to, to, your, um, to your potential hire or potential companies. Um, putting your things out on LinkedIn, um, just, uh, there's a lot of people in the Click community where they have, um, I, I apologize, I don't remember the um, specific company that does it, but they have contests that you can just submit your data. You don't have to work there or work at a company that works with them. You can just submit your data and they pick winners all the time and they advertise that. They show what you have done um, in a public forum. So there's a lot of ways that you can do that as well. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. As a hiring manager, I, I think there, in addition to that, and what that shows is your capabilities, but also your initiative to go get stuff done, right? Highlighting the skills that you have because and your ability to learn new things, um, your drive, your motivation, your, you know, that's those kinds of things, whether you know the specific tool that they're using or not. If you can show that you're a quick learner and that you take initiative, those those are the skill sets that employers are looking for. I love that. That's so true. So true. Martha, what do you think on the on the topic? Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with with Carl. Hey, Carl, sorry. Um, that it's not always about the tool or or necessarily coming with a portfolio, uh, visual portfolio of everything you've done. But I think it, it it's just uh, tapping into your skills what you're what are you good at are you good at finding patterns are you good at identifying trends are you good at at, at knowing how to use the data and, and maybe um leaning on that to to make a good good sell of yourself like or um so yeah that, that's mostly on what i rely on personally so um through this dashboard through this initiative we were able to reduce i don't know the use of um uh, alerts or how this mm -hmm. was prior we managed to change this process so focusing more on on how you brought value I think Will was mentioning that how, how you bring value to the company how you would be able to drive change and just uh, highlighting what you're good at nice I love it Ro anything else to add to all of the, the great advice we've had so far I think, yeah, uh, I really agree with it all. I think the other side of it, which we briefly mentioned before, was the networking part of it, right? Just once you have your portfolio ready, just go on LinkedIn, find someone that works for this company, drop them drop them a message because it's, you know, you have to start somewhere. Um, and if it's a larger organization, I found that a lot of the times they'll have referral policies in place, uh, referral schemes, sorry. Um, so just message someone that works with that organization and find out if it's actually where you want to work, right? Like, hey, can we have a coffee? True. Even if it's, you know, on Zoom for 15 minutes. Um, yeah, and and yeah, learn more from someone who's on the inside first as well. Um, yeah, I think that's really valuable for you too. 
Awesome. Now I realize we're sort of at the hour now. Um, I feel like we could have this, this Zoom call for probably two or three hours with all the questions we have and all the conversation that's going on. But uh, unfortunately, it's not the world we live in. Um, so I did want to promise that any questions that we haven't got to, you know, or the, the chat that we may have missed, um, I'll make sure that any answers are included in the follow up. So, so don't worry about missing out on that. Um, I want to say a big thank you to Melissa, Martha, Ro, Michelle. Um, it's been phenomenal. Thank you so much for everything you shared, um, all the experiences, all the knowledge, uh, all the resources. It, it truly has been fantastic. I know on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much for, for joining the panel and sharing everything that you have today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, awesome. Jason, for having us and for organizing. It's great. <laughs> Easy from my perspective. I can just sit here and ask questions. I, I don't have to provide any answers. It's been absolutely dreamy. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing everyone on the next one. Cheers. Have an awesome rest of your day and see us all soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.